Well, thank you very much for that introduction, and um, I'm terrified to be here. You're, you're the most important audience I have ever spoken to. So I did once get a, a talk at the Seattle Gans meeting in, in Madison, and there were about 15 billion people in the audience, but I couldn't see any of them, and we had about, I can't remember what it was, was it four minutes or something in those days? So you got up and you spoke as fast as you could and hoped that your slides changed. But you're the people um, who are most important to me in terms of my science. And the other person who was most important to me is John Sulston. So as many of you know, John Sulston died uh, this year. John was a mentor to me, not in any formal way, but he was always there when I had a bunch of questions. And he was also a mentor to me in what Patrick talked about in this idea of this open community and sharing and people um, talking openly about ideas and questions and sharing reagents. And uh, he set, he along with Sidney Brenner, set the stage for, for the C. Allegans field being very open and hopefully that passed on to us. But he also took that attitude from the C. Allegans project onto the Human Genome Project and the many other things he was involved in. Um, and I miss him a lot. So um, he published this paper some time ago, um, 1973, um, which he describes the DNA of C. elegans. It's 8 times 10 to the 7 base pairs. They knew it was in six chromosomes of that size. It has a base composition. It has RNA cistrons, dot, dot, dot. And that's it. I mean, basically, I should stop my talk here and say if there are any questions. John's probably answered them. And this, this work is typical of the absolute precision John brought to his work. He wasn't scared of changing field, doing something different. As we all know, he sat for 18 months at a microscope lineaging uh, C. elegans embryos. But he also worked tirelessly on genomics of nematodes and other things. So I miss John. Um, so this is, this is the worm genome. It's, if you like, the SI unit of genomes. It's 100,000 base pairs approximately, which is a lovely small size, especially if you're doing Illumina sequencing. It fits neatly into all sorts of multiples of Illumina sequencing lanes. It's got six chromosomes, which is a nice number. You can count them on the fingers of one and a bit hands. Um, and it's, it's very malleable, as we know C. elegans is a wonderful genetic organism. But is it representative of nematode genomes? So I'm going to give this talk basically standing on the shoulders of lots of people who've done work, and I get to think about it a bit. Um, in my lab, especially Lewis Stevens and Dominic Leitch, two recent, well, Dominic's a recent PhD student, Lewis is still with us, and other people in the lab who worked uh, with me on this. Uh, with the 50 Helmets Consortium, which is James Cotton, who's in the audience, and Nancy Holride and colleagues, including Matt, Macadon, and Don, and all the people in the Cinerabditis communities who've worked with us and helped us along the way in understanding the data we've been generating. So as was mentioned, 1998 was a, a good year. It was the year that the first animal genome was sequenced, and that genome was the genome of C. elegans. And this publication, it's got the front cover of science, of course, this publication laid out this beautiful genome, which, as I say, is possibly the SI unit of genomes. One of the things that struck me about this genome sequence was just how beautifully patterned it is, how strongly structured it is. So the autosomes have a very strong structure. This is chromosome 1, telomere up here, telomere down here. It has two arms, which have a high proportion of repeats, and a center, which has a low proportion of repeats. If you map genes on the arms, the center is the, the concentrations of genes, or the, the abundance of genes, density of genes is about the same, but the genes in the centers of the C. elegans chromosomes are more likely to be conserved with other organisms. At the time, the only comparators were yeasts and humans, um, are more likely to be conserved than the arms, than the genes on the arms. So the idea is that these arms are the places where gene novelty is happening, where evolution is happening fast, and the centers, if you like, are a frozen bit of the genome where uh, conservation is the rule. But is this true? Is this true of all genomes? So if we looked at any nematode genome, would we find the same pattern? How fixed is this pattern? How fixed is the pattern of six chromosomes? How fixed is the pattern of having arms and centers? The other thing that happened in uh, 1998 was uh, the paper we published on the molecular evolutionary framework for uh, nematoda. That produced this tree. C. elegans is up here, so whenever I put C. elegans on a slide, because I'm talking about lots of species, I put a little green heart, just to, so you can all play uh, where's the worm on my slides and see if you can find the C. elegans. So C. elegans is part of the Rhabditida, which is up here in clade five. This is clade four, three, two, and one. Three, four, and five, just remind you, are part of a, a supergroup which we call C for Chromodoria, uh, but the, um, Chromodoria, sorry. Um, 
uh, and it's a kind of paraphyletic series. So these three clades here, five, four, and three, are subsets of clade C. And from this tree, we could say that Ceramidatis elegans is related to a bunch of interesting parasites of animals. This little mouse means that this group parasitizes animals. That animal parasitism has occurred all over the tree, but also that C. elegans is a very derived nematode. It's not, it doesn't sit down at the base of the tree. It's part of a, a crown group. So I'm going to do today is go through three bits of work we've been doing recently. One is about nematode genomes. We've been sequencing a lot of genomes. I'm going to go through basically where we are and suggestions where should we go next. You can all guess that my answer is sequence everything, but I'll come back to that. Then something about nematode evolution and basically revisiting the tree um, you just saw, which was based on one gene, the small subunit ribosomal RNA gene, and looking at how that tree looks with multiple genes. And then also talk about nematode genome evolution, getting to that question as to whether that structure of the C. elegans genome is fixed or not. So here we are. This is a graph I've produced before. It's been updated for this meeting, except for some Cinerabditis genomes in here. Here's C. elegans. This is the size of the genomes in millions of base pairs. And these are the genomes, individual species arranged along here, organized by those clades. So the first thing to note is that many genomes are somewhere around 100 million base pairs, which is the C. elegans size. But the mean of this set of genomes is actually much greater than 100. So it's about 148. And that's because we've sequenced a lot of rather large genomes. There's a group here, which are genomes of the large roundworms of pigs, horses, and other animals. And these are up around uh, 300 million bases. And there's a group here, which are parasitic again, which are parasites of, of many vertebrates, including the largest genome here, which is from Hylygmus moides bakeri, a parasite in mice. So it's likely that these genomes are big, something to do with parasitism. The C. elegans genome, it turns out, is approximately an average size nematode genome, although many genomes are much smaller. And the smallest one so far is Pratiolenchus coffei, which is a genome of only 20 megabases. Yes, that's four E. coli's. It has 6,000 genes. It's a plant parasite, so it, it uh, manages to manipulate plants. It does all sorts of clever things, but has a very, very reduced genome. The colors on these graphs uh, tell you something about the, the quality of the assembly. So the blue bits are the length of the assembly that's in contigs greater than 10,000 bases. They're greater than 1,000 bases, then uh, greater than 100 bases. I think you can see from this that some of the longest genomes have very poor assemblies. And we think that probably some of this long genome here may be due to a poor assembly. But many of the genomes are actually very, very good now. So we have a lot of genomes and a lot of species across the tree. Um, I'm going to tell you a bit about the Cinerabditis Genomes Project, which we've been running, which mostly been done by uh, Lewis Stevens. Our aim is to sequence all the genomes of all the species in the genus Cinerabditis. And this, the idea here is really to put C. elegans in its place phylogenetically. So C. elegans is an instance of something that's happened in nem nematode evolution. And we want to know where it's come from. And because all these species are pretty malleable experimentally, it means if you have a question about C. elegans, and there's something different about one of the other species, we want to provide the background toolkit that you can use to go and do CRISPR or under any other manipulation. So this is the status of the project at the moment. These red and blue and gray boxes show where we've got sequence and assemblies. So we're now at uh, 40 species that have genome sequence and 32 which also have gene calls, which also have protein-based gene calls. And um, there are, well, when we started this project, there were 51 species in the, known in the genus. I'll come back to that. But uh, we're doing pretty well. So again, C. elegans is here. And the Cinerabditis genus can be split into two groups on this tree. I'll, I'll come back to why this tree might not be correct. Um, there's the elegans group, supergroup up here, and the Drosophily supergroup down here. And we have genomes now for species across both of these groups. We also have, importantly, species, uh, genome sequences for species which come off as a comb-like series at the base of the genus including Cinerobditis monodelphis, which, if you like, allow us to root any changes that are happening further up the tree. So what can we do with these genomes? Well, we can build a better phylogenetic tree. That's what we've done with these 32 that have um, gene calls. And uh, Lewis has pulled out just under 2,000 one-to-one orthologs across this tree and has uh, inferred this phylogeny. This phylogeny pretty much agrees with uh, previous ones done with smaller numbers of genes. 
except for the fact that the Drosophila supergroup is not monophyletic. So rather than being a single group, the Drosophila supergroup is a, at least two parts. So we're not quite sure what's going to happen. We're going to add more genomes here to sort this out. But it places C. elegans in this elegans group. There's a Japonica group, there's elegans supergroup, and the Drosophila supergroup. So we're going to continue to update this tree, and so you'll be able to access this tree at any time. This tree, importantly, gives us a background uh, piece of data against which to map gene evolution. So gene and genome evolution. So for example, here's a mapping of genome size across the, uh, the tree. And I hope you see there's some exciting things on here. There are some genomes which are very big in the region of 160 kilobases. Some of these we think are because the genome assemblies aren't very good and these need to be redone. This one here, Cisnodratis species uh, 27, really is very long. The other thing is some of the genomes are very short. So Cisnodratis drosophilae and Cisnodratis species 2, which doesn't have a name yet, have got genomes of 55 megabases. So just less, just more than half of what's in C. elegans. So we don't have gene calls for these yet, but that's going to be very interesting to work out. So the drivers of genome size in Cerebritis are both phylogenetic, so some clades have longer genomes than other clades, and also reproductive modes. This has also been worked on before, that uh, hermaphrodite and sexual, fully sexual species that are sisters to each other have different genome sizes. One of the contributions to genome size is non-coding DNA. One of the main pieces of non-coding DNA is introns. And one of the things we've been very surprised to see, was initially found by Kang Kyonke um, in the Fitch lab, is that Cerebritis elegans has lost many, many introns, about 40% of all the introns in this set of shared orthologous genes compared to outgroup taxa. And this is reflected across the whole uh, Cerebritis clade, that there's been ongoing intronic loss um, in all, all the genes we measured um, as the group has evolved. So we're not sure what's driving this. This is a very, very striking feature. So we can root this tree with the outgroup uh, Diploscaptor coronatus or Diploscaptor pachys, where they have many, many, many introns, many more introns than do Cinerabdati species, and we see a, a graded loss of introns up the tree. So intron presence and absence is very dynamic up the tree. It'll be very interesting to look at what is driving this, this intron loss and uh, whether this contributes to uh, changes in genome size. Initial analysis says it's not really a uh, driver of changes in genome size. As I said, the other thing we can do with the tree is start mapping gene families onto this tree. So we can take all the proteins in all the genomes we've sequenced, um, define orthologous groups, and then map these orthologous groups back on the tree. So this is a gene family tree for um, EGF domain uh, signaling components of the GLP1 LIN12 system. So GLP1 and LIN12 have interesting biology in C. elegans. GLP1 is germline proliferation, so knocking this out prevents germline proliferation, and LIN12 is involved in, amongst other things, uh, vulval differentiation. So there's two genes in C. elegans, but if we take all the GLP1 LIN12 orthologs across the uh, Cinerobditis tree, we find that this outgroup here of the Drosophila group and the outgroups only have one, whereas members of the elegans supergroup have at least two. And we map two du duplications, one here, which results in two C. elegans ones, and a second one here because in the Japonica subgroup there are two copies which are distinct. So this suggests that the differentiation in function between GLP1 and LIN12, which we see in C. elegans, and which has been part of a lot of, a lot of uh, genetic research, is something that's quite recent, something that's happened by subfunctionalization of a duplicated gene after this point. So what are the GLP1 and LIN12 orthologs doing here? Are these ones doing both functions? And what's the function of this GLP1-like ortholog, which is uniquely present in this group of Japonica group species? So that's one gene out of the 35,000 gene families that we can find in Cinerobditis. So if you work on the gene, find its gene family in the Cinerobditis genomes and ask what's happened uh, during history. It can tell you a lot about the biology of the gene. All these data, as, as Patrick said, we try and make them as open as possible. We have a, a database called Cinerobditis.org. The idea of Cinerobditis.org is to release the data as soon as is possible. Ultimately, it all goes into Wormbase, which is the correct place for it, not Cinerobditis.org. Um, 
And in Wormbase, it'll be curated forever. But until it's ready to be published or it's ready to be um, put into Wormbase, we keep it here. So all the data are available here, including we download C. elegans from Wormbase. Each genome has a, a landing page which gives you some basic statistics. You can do blasts against the genome. You can look at the, the uh, you can browse the genome, and you can download the genome freely. What comes next? Well, we have another bunch of species about to be sequenced by us. The sun's being sequenced by other people. We haven't yet sourced or put in a plan uh, for these eight species. And so, but we're nearly there. We're getting close. I don't know. Well, we hope that Lewis manages to finish the genus before he finishes his PhD. I think I will have to let him go before he does. But, um, but of course, the community hasn't stopped looking for Cinerobdytuses. And uh, the list keeps growing. So we're now up to species 56. Um, and there's a, a new set of species, so we may have to develop methods for, or protocols for sequencing these ones to add to the tree. So what do I recommend we do next? First one is that we sequence more genomes, of course. Not only of Cinerabditis to finish this Cinerabditis clade, but also more genomes across the tree. One of the issues with some of the sequencing we've done so far is we've either sequenced parasites, which is very important because they kill humans and plants and our domestic animals, or we sequence free-living nematodes which have weird sexual behavior. So they're either parthenogens or they have some uh, other strange piece of uh, sexual biology, which means that we don't expect their genomes to really be representative of, of genomes as a whole. So more genomes. We also want better genomes, so we want chromosome level assemblies, and I'll come back to that in a minute. And we want cleaner genomes. So one of the issues we've dealt with on the tardigrade project, but also elsewhere, is that genomes can come contaminated, usually with E. coli or uh, Stenotrophomonas from people's cultures, but also with other things. I'll quickly go through what Lewis has been doing with Minine, and this is only an example because many people have been using next generation or third generation technologies to sequence uh, nematode genomes. There are two major long read technologies. One is PacBio, this giant fridge here, which generates nice long reads using zero mode waveguides and a movie system that calls bases. And this one here, which is a handheld nearly device, which has a, a nanopore which reads se uh, sequence by the way that different DNA sequences block the current flowing through the nanopore. So Lewis has been um, nanopore sequencing Cinerobditis monodelphis, which is the basal, the spe species that arise basally from uh, in, in Cinerobditis, and um, we published this paper uh, a year and a half ago now, and it's the first time a paper had been published describing an animal species with the genome as part of the description. And uh, I think that's a really important thing. We can now, as part of the description of a species, description of a, a, a biological entity, include the entire genome sequence. But this was a draft genome sequence, so Lewis wants to make it much better. So he's been sequencing with the minion. This is these are the data from the minion assembly, and these are the data from the original Lumina assembly. And um, this this graph here shows a, a cumulative cover or cumulative span as you line the contigs up in order of length. This is the original assembly. The total span was about 115 million bases, so about 15 million bases longer than C. elegans. And with the minion assembly, also using the Illumina data to polish it, the assembly is slightly bigger. The number of contigs is much smaller. And uh, the overall contiguity of the genome is much better. So this represents a much better assembly. It's still not quite chromosomal, but it's much better. And so this, these sorts of data are what we need to make these genomes better. But they also show us a couple of things. This genome is longer. So this is the increase in genome span in uh, the pack bio or minion or joint pack bio and minion assemblies compared to the original Illumina or other reference. The Cinerobditis elegans genomes have been sequenced using these long-read technologies are about 2 million base pairs longer than the published uh, 1998 paper. Cinerobditis monodelphis, again, is about 2 million base pairs longer. In Pristioncus, the packed by a raw assembly is um, uh, about 15, and the polished assembly is about 18 million bases. Nipostromus brasiliensis, a genome, that, a nematode that has a 300 million base pair genome, there's an extra 50 million base pairs found when you do pack bio sequencing. And our sequencing of Haligmus moides bakeri, which started out as about uh, 570 million base pairs, is now at 700 million base pairs. So you see there's a, a very nice linear trend here in how much longer the genome gets with um, 
long read sequencing, and this is mostly due to the fact that we're discovering new repeats. And these repeats were collapsed in the Illumina assemblies, and that's true in xenorhabditis as much as anywhere else, and are now revealed by packed biosequencing. Repeats, Schmidt. I mean, who cares about repeats? Well, some people do, but they're also very important. So here's, oops, here's another paper by John Sulston, John Ellis, um, talking about the ribosomal DNA of xenorhabditis C. elegans. They describe very carefully in sequence the ribosomal RNA cistron of C. elegans and also counted it. There are 55 copies. But in the published sequence, in the worm-based reference of it, there are one and a half copies because it's the same sequence repeated many times. There's the 5S RNA, 5S ribosomal RNA SL1 repeat sequence, which John Silston showed should be about 110 of them, but there's only 15 of them in the genome. So these, this is half of the two megabases that uh, is now present in the, the revised packed biogenomes. So these repeats are important biologically and tell us something about the biology of the organism. The same is true of, of Pristioncus. So um, Pristioncus pacificus, the genome increased uh, by about 18 megabases. And uh, what happened was from having just over 200 SL1 repeats, there are now over 600 SL1 repeats. And from having uh, about 10 5S repeats, there are now 100 tandem copies. And uh, the SL 5S RNA repeat in uh, Pristioncus is very different from that in C. elegans, but basically we can identify uh, unique signature sequences for chromosome 4, chromosome X, this contig, which is probably part of chromosome 4, and then um, some uh, copies which are found elsewhere. So sequencing the genomes with long read technologies pulls out repeats, but these repeats can be very important. In Hilary Plasmoides Bakeri, the one increased by 150 million base pairs, these new repeats are the sources of small interfering RNAs, siRNAs, which are then exported by the nematode, packaged up in little vesicles, along with a particular secreted argonaut protein, and delivered to the cells, the gut cells of its host, where they interfere <coughs> with host cell immune function. So these new repeats are actually evolving rapidly to have new function. I mentioned uh, cleaning assemblies up. This is our blob toolkit, which is a way of cleaning assemblies. This is a particular assembly. This is the nematode bit, colored green here. It's almost heterozygous, so you can see there's a, a band of contigs here, which are all one particular coverage. The band of contigs here, which are approximately half that coverage. This is the nematode. These are repeats in that nematode genome. But this assembly also has contigs which are of similar GC, but not completely similar GC, but much lower coverage. So this con set of contigs here, which is at lower coverage, so not equimolar coverage to the genome, are likely contamination. In this case, they map to chordate. This is from a, uh, um, an animal parasite. These are the host. So we don't want to be calling host genes as being part of the nematode genome. So we need to clean these genomes up. PacBio helps a lot with that. So. We should sequence more genomes. We should sequence them longer to get chromosomal contiguity, and uh, we should make sure they're clean. So we can use these genomes quite quickly to look at nematode-based, uh, genome-based phylogeny. So this is the proteomes predicted from these genomes. This is not all the 160-odd genomes. This is just uh, 71 of them. This is C. elegans again here, showing that most genomes have some in the region between 10 and 20,000 proteins. So C. elegans is odd in having a lot of proteins compared to many genomes. Um, it's probably also because C. elegans is one of the organisms that's been most worked on most uh, thoroughly, and so we know more about the, the transcription units in this genome. Um, some genomes have many, many more sequence, uh, protein coding sequences than this, including this one here. Huge number. This may be because these genomes have been assembled as haploid, double haploids, so, they're so the two alleles are so different that we've actually got two copies of every genome, every gene in the genome. So, um, for example, in Diploscapta, where there are two copies of the, the genome in the assemblies, there are many more genes than you'd expect. The red ones here are uh, proteins which are very small, between 30 and 100 amino acids, and some of the genomes have quite a high proportion of very small proteins predicted in them. This is because people use different prediction toolkits. And so these protein predictions are not all of the same quality, and that's a real problem because it could mean that if you have a very badly predicted proteome, it results in you making poor inferences about the biology of the organism. 
One example of this, which is not to point fingers, uh, but just to say it's, it's fixable, this is the original published uh, proteome of Heterobditis bacteriophora. This is an entomopathogenic pathogenic nematode, which is relatively closely related to C. elegans. It's clade 5. And one of the exciting things about the published proteome is that uh, there are these uh, 5,000 or so proteins which are absolutely unique to heterobditis and might underpin its unique behavior. But what's odd about these proteins, across the whole of the proteome, in fact, is they have lots and lots and lots of non-canonical splice sites. So GCAG is not the usual splice sites. Uh, so it should be GTAG. And so they have many, many non-canonical splice sites per gene. So we've re-annotated the heterobditis bacteriophora genome using RNA-seq, and we get a small number of unique genes, which is normal, about 1,000. Many more of these proteins match better to other proteins from other nematodes, and we have a normal number of GCAG and TRUN. So I think we can go back and re-annotate these genomes in a consistent way. What we have done um, is use these genomes to revisit the nematode phylogeny, and uh, this uses uh, a tool written by Dominic Leitch called Kinfin, which we're very proud of. Um, it's a, a tool which makes the problem of dealing with 1.35 million proteins from 69 species simple. And so we have a, a toolkit which goes through and takes these proteins, does an all versus all blast, uses orthofibrin to define orthology groups, uses Kinfin to choose orthologs of interest, one to one to ones, and uh, various other tools to end up with orthogroups that we can then build trees from. Some other data come out of Kinfin, which are, I find really surprising. So this is, a, if you like, a, a collector's curve of uh, proteins from different groups of nematodes, where we basically start with one, one species, add the next one, work out how many new gene families we have, add the next one, work out how many new gene families we have. And so we end up with a curve that describes the clade. And this envelope around the curve is randomizing addition order. Okay, so this is, this pink line here is clade 5, which is the one with C. elegans in. There's about 35,000 different protein families in the 25 species of clade 5 in this analysis. Clade 4, we've only analyzed uh, just under 20 species, but the curve is generally following the same trajectory as the clade 5 one, in that it looks like it's going to asymptote sometime around uh, 35 to 40,000. What's really surprising is clade 3, which is a clade which is full of parasites. There are no free-living species in here. Clade 3, the asymptote looks to be heading for 20,000 proteins, 25,000 proteins at maximum. So this is not because of undersampling of clade 3. We've sampled right across the diversity of clade 3. It's not because of the, relate, the close relatedness of the nematodes in clade 3. We sampled from right across the phylogenetic disparity in the clade. So it does look really like clade 3 have much reduced diversity in their genome compared to clade 4 and 5. So what this means is that there will be proteins which are very common in clade 4 and 5, which are absent from clade 3, might tell us by uh, exclusion what clade 3 is not doing, but also might tell us about what's important uh, to nematodes of clade 4 and 5 in terms of their lifestyle. Remember, there are parasites in, of, of animals in both these clades. There's also parasites of animals in clade 4. So there's something special about this group here. If we look at the... the uh, distribution of cluster size across this set of uh, nearly 300,000 clusters. There are lots which are only, there's one sequence in one species, so these are unique sequences. But for example, if you look at the ones that have two sequences, there's um, about uh, 20,000 of these clusters, three, four, five, six. You see there's a nice power law here. As we, this is a log scale, the number of proteins in cluster, the number of clusters. Nice power law here relating these two. That's what you'd expect from a random stochastic process. There's a nice bump here in this process, which is exactly at the number of taxa we put in. So this is where we'll find the one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one orthologs that we can build phylogenies of. This is the core shared set of proteins in this group of nematodes. This is a pattern we see in all the analyses we do across the phylum. And we can use those sequences to build a tree. So this is 69 nematode species, 519 proteins, and 62,000 sites. Remember, the original tree was 53 uh, nematodes, but only about 1,600 sites in one gene. And this is the tree we get. We get the same structure as we got for the, 16, the 18S gene, which is very good. There's some interesting uh, components to it. We managed to include a clade C nematode, which nicely roots 3, 4, and 5. We've got good separation of clade 3, 4, and 5. 
which wasn't available before. And we have a sequence from Peter Sarkis of, of Poikilamus oxysaca, a free living nematode, which is now an outgroup to uh, Pristionchus plus the, the uh, strong isles and Cinerobdites elegans, which I forgot to put a green heart on. I do apologize. There are three nodes in this tree which um, are less than 96%. This one here, 73, which is the one that separates 4 and 5 from 3. That's been often been very difficult to work out. There's one here, 47%, which means there's no support for this at all, which is placing A. nanus, Acromboloides nanus, which is a free-living uh, cephalobe nematode. So it's not clear where that sits. The other one is the 50% here, which is separating the ascarids, the pinworms, and the filarial nematodes from each other. Again, this may be because actually of poor gene predictions in Parascoristicorum. So there's still some work to be done, and adding more species will no doubt help. So again, what's next? More, ge more genomes, better genomes, and cleaner genomes. But I think especially unsampled groups such as clade 2, which doesn't appear on these trees, and members of clade C. We need better gene prediction sets, and I think um, we probably need to get together and decide who's going to do this and re-predict the gene sets on all these genomes in exactly the same way. Otherwise, we may just be uh, analyzing the differences between people's technology. And we need deeper analyses. So we want to include more orthologs in the phylogeny and also try and add additional features such as syntony and operon position. Last thing I want to talk about is nematode genome evolution. And this really relies on other people's data, other people having made beautiful, high-quality assemblies. And I apologize, I know I'm the first talk in this meeting, and this meeting is about nematodes, and especially C. elegans, and we're not meant to talk about the fly, but this picture has a fly on it, so I do don't want to insult anybody. So it's also very garishly colored. This is from the um, Drosophila Multiple Genomes Project uh, paper um, showing uh, the chromosomes of Drosophila here and different species here and showing the rearrangements and translocations that link these chromosomes. And so the, the story here is that there are identifiable units of evolution in fly chromosomes. These tend to travel together through phylogenetic time. So the distance across this tree is about 40 million years, across these species about 40 million years. And the major changes you see are rearrangements within these units and sometimes fusion and breakage of chromosomes across the centromeres. So this, this set of uh, species here have got uh, two-armed chromosomes. This, these ones here have got uh, chromosomes with uh, um, two, uh, centromeres at the end. There's one translocation here in pseudo obscura. But basically, these units seem to travel together. These are called Muller elements. They're defined using um, chromosome banding techniques many, many years ago and have been confirmed by sequence. So this is how a fly organizes a genome. There are genes on chromosomes which travel together through long periods of evolutionary time and therefore possibly are co-evolving. But this unit here is something that acts in evolution. So is the same true of Cinerabditis? So if you remember the beautiful picture, this is taken from Vicky Hunt's paper, just as a single chromosome. Um, uh, in elegans of genes, uh, inverted repeats and tandem repeats across the chromosome arms and centers. And this is the pattern of GC content across that chromosome. So that in the center, the GC content is, is much more consistent, whereas the arms, there's a much more variance in GC content. So these arms and centers correspond on the, uh, to recombination units, if you like, recombination zones. This is from Matt Rockman's paper showing that each chromosome has a central portion which has lower recombination rate compared to the arms. And that each arm and each center has a typical recombination rate. And these Mary maps de uh, define the arms and centers genetically. So this is linked to this somehow. So which one drives which is not clear. And they result in large scale patterns such as this where you have focusing of GC content in the center not much variance, a much higher variance of GC content in the arms. So we can now go and look at other species and ask, is the C. elegans genome representative? Are the six chromosomes in the C. elegans, uh, do they represent units or elements as the Drosophila chromosomes do? 
So this is again from Sunil Ramdas's Monadelphus. This is taking 130 new contigs that represent 97% of the assembly. And if you map for each contig which C. elegans gene, G, uh, chromosome, the genes come from, 90% of the genes reside on contigs that um, are a majority of the genes on that contig also reside on the same, <laughs> homologues of the same chromosome in C. elegans. So this suggests that this chromosome unit, set of chromosome units in Pseudorhabditis elegans are conserved to Pseudorhabditis monodelphus. So the counts of chromosome numbers in Pseudorhabditis is always about six, there's always six, so that's not surprising, but there is very little translocation between chromosomes. There's, um, there's two e events here we're just checking up on to check whether that's misassemblies or whether this is true. But 90% of the genes travel with other genes which are always on the same chromosome. And that's across the full depth of the genus Cynorhabditis. So this looks like elements as seen in Drosophila. However, Lewis produced this graph, which is completely befuddling. So remember the genes in the centers are the ones that are conserved, and they have a conservation right back to yeast. So the genes in the centers tend to be more conserved than the genes in the arms. But if you actually map the monodelphous context assigned, in this case, to chromosome 5, compared to C. elegans chromosome 5, and you order the C. monodelphous chromosome uh, context as best you can, by, for example, the median position, the order of the median position of all their genes, you see this horrible knitting pattern, which suggests that the center in monodelphous must be different from the center in Cynorhabditis elegans. So the genes travel together on a chromosome, but their linear order along the chromosome, especially the order of arm, center, arm, is different between the two taxa. So I can't quite get my head around this because if these are the conserved genes, this must mean that the middle of this chromosome, whatever order these contigs really are in, must have a different set of conserved genes if it has conserved genes in it at all. So we can extend this beyond just seen rhabditis by looking at the chromosomes of other species. And there's this lovely paper by Arthur Walton in 1959 where he looked at some parasites in their chromosomes. And it gives a lovely list of all the species he looked at. This is his uh, species list for nematoda. And there's a very interesting pattern across nematoda. Here's clade five. And the, the base number for the three major groups in clade five is six. It's not to say there aren't species with different numbers of chromosomes. Diploscaptopathis and Coronatus have one. But the base number appears to be six. So is there something special about six? What's special about having six chromosomes? So beautifully, we have the genome of Christianus pacificus now in chromosomes based on the uh, PAC biosequencing. And I hope you can see, for example, here on chromosome two, we have repeats at the ends of the chromosome, conserved genes in the middle of the chromosome. This looks like the same sort of unit we see in C. elegans. And indeed, if we look at the GC content of that chromosome, we find a focused GC in the middle. These dots that are down below are because of ends in the, the genome sequence. So GC content is, is uh, more focused in the middle than on the arms. And we also, from the Wilsberger paper, we also see there's a Mary map which has a, a flat region across the center. So that's great. Chromosome 2 looks like the chromosome of C. elegans. So exactly the same structure. But there's problems. Here's chromosome 1. So this is chromosome 1 here, which has a peak of repeats at the end, and a peak of repeats at the end, and also a peak of repeats in the middle has a peak of conserved genes here and a peak of conserved genes here. So it looks like two chromosomes stuck together. So this could be an error in assembly, but it's not because it's genetically mapped. Genetically, chromosome one has a standard Mary map. But if you look at the GC content, there are two apparent dips in GC corresponding to these conserved gene regions. So chromosome one looks a bit like two chromosomes stuck end to end. This is chromosome one. One half of chromosome one is very like chromosome five in C. elegans. There are a few genes from other chromosomes in there. This is half megabase slices of the chromosome. The other half looks like chromosome X. So this looks like a fusion between perhaps half of chromosome X and chromosome five. There are some other bits, chromosome four in, in Christophilus is pretty messed up here, but this really looks like a chromosome fusion, such that this pattern here is, if you like, a relic 
of sticking two patterns like this together. So in, in Rosberger et al's paper, they analyze this in some detail. They provide a, a hypothesis that actually the pattern we're seeing is that this segment here and this segment here were ancestrally together, and they've split in C. elegans, which, which is, which is a, a very co coherent model, because this 5x association is found in other species. So for example, in, in um, Fabrice Besnard and Georges Koutsovos' <coughs> sequencing of Asheus to Puli, this linkage group here has a mix of x and 5 sequence. Some blocks of it are largely x, others are x and 5. So again, there's a, an association between X and 5 in Oshias to Puli, which is more closely related to Cinerobdatis elegans than it is to Bristiontis. Uh, Christian and, and, and uh, Rosberger et al. also analyzed uh, stromalized rati, which the, uh, James Cotton and colleagues and, and, and Vicky Hunt uh, produced a chromosomal assembly of earlier and showed that stromalized rati chromosome 2 looks very much like a mix-up of three and one, and a mix-up of X and five again in C. elegans. Chromosome one looks like a mix-up of X and five with a bit that's a mix-up of three and one, and these ones are slightly more confused. So this association between X and five is straight, extends out to clade four. Interestingly, the chromosomes of strong as rati don't have this strong repeats at the end and conservation in the middle structure, and the same with the GC content it's pretty flat and pretty evenly distributed in terms of variance along the chromosomes. So there's something different about Strongloid's rati chromosomes, but it's still true that Strongloid's rati chromosome 2, for example, does have a section on the end which looks like 5 and X of C. elegans mixed together. To move on to another bit of work by James Cotton and the people at, at the Sanger Institute here, this is the chromosomal assembly of Ogocerpa volvulus. This is a, a, a lovely uh, surplus plot showing for all the genes in C. elegans here, which have homologs in, one-to-one uh, -one homologs in O. volvulus, where those genes map in O. volvulus. And I hope you can see that there's a, a chromosome here, which appears to have bits of C. elegans chromosome 1, and a mix-up here of C. elegans chromosome X. So that's a 1X association. And then there's a chromosome here, chromosome 3, which seems to have bits from everywhere. Again, if we look at the GC content across these chromosomes, so, uh, Onkocerca volvulus has a very, very striking pattern. Onkocerca has, on average, a much higher AT content or lower GC than the other nematodes I've been showing. And it has a s piece in the center, which is a much lower variance, and again, arms. So we'd suggest that this is arms, center, arms of chromosome 3. And again, if you look at the other larger chromosomes in in uh, Onkocerca, this is chromosome 1, which is actually assembled in two fragments, but it has arms, center, arm, and then another arm, center, arm. So again, it looks like two chromosomes fused together. The same with chromosome X, arms, center, arms, arms, center, arms. If these chromosomes are behaving uh, um, holocentrically like C. elegans it does, we don't think this, this is a centromere, but uh, there's no uh, evidence that they're not holocentric, but this is a very striking picture where this unit is distinct from this unit, and they're behaving quite separately in this chromosome. So my summary of this is that arms and centers pattern is common, but not universal in Cinerobdite, in, in nematodes. The ones we've looked at anyway, so this is only three, four, and five. It does correlate with recombinant f combination frequency where we have it, but um, we don't know which, dr which drives which. My bias is that it's recombination frequency is, is like to drive the pattern, but I'm, that's not clear. We've got evidence of rare interchromosomal exchanges and fusions. And these fuse, fused chromosomes, where they're stuck together, retain the signatures of the arms and centers of the chromosomes they came from. So each segment has a clear identity. So remember in Christioncus, the X part, X, uh, the genes which were similar to the ones of the C. elegans, X, um, are all still together on the Christianchus chromosome. So this suggests that there's, there's uh, an inhibition of these genes moving from one chromosome part to another. Um, but intrachromosomal rearrangement is extremely common. So in the background of this, this should not be maintained. But in the background of this, this is maintained, so these two halves must be kept separate somehow. So I come up from this with three hypotheses, which would be lovely to test with full-length chromosomal genome sequences from across the nematoda. 
arms and centers, patterns in GC, gene content, etc. Define what uh, Matt Rackman, Rackman called Vigo elements, instead of calling them Muller elements, and that these are generated and decay slowly, so they're uh, a, a unit of chromosomal evolution in at least the rhabditid, the 3, 4, 5 nematodes, is one of these units here, this unit, this unit. These nematode chromosomes have deeply conserved structural units, and C. elegans somehow r represents a retained ancestral carrier type. So somehow C. elegans has got these sorted out. I don't know if that's true. That's unlikely to be true. Um, there's this wonderful uh, story from um, uh, Nizradin, who uh, was looking, it's been translated into, into lots of things, was, was looking under, under, um, uh, under a palm tree for something he'd lost, and when asked why he was looking there, when he hadn't lost it there, it says this place is the only place with shade. That switched around in these days to say it's the only place that had light when we look under lampposts. But there's something about these ancestral units, and C. elegans seems to be a good, or the Cinerobditis seems to be a good representation of that. The other thing this means is that the genes that are stuck on these units have been co-located on the same units for large periods of evolutionary time. So for the Drosophila, that was about 39 to 40 million years. For these nematodes, we don't actually have a date for the base of 345, but it's going to be hundreds of millions of years. So um, they've been located in the same linear linkage group for many millions of years and are like to have co-evolved such a translocation to another linkage group through the tiers. It's be interesting to know which genes can move and which genes cannot. Okay, so I'm going to leave those, those are the questions for the next few years of my life, I guess. Um, are these nigon elements? And if they are, why? I have no idea. Why would you organize your genome like this? It's beautiful, but I don't know why, and I want to know why. People who have been helping me are Dominic, who's not here, Lewis, who is, Rich, who's not here, Suja, who's not here, Georges, who is, and Laura, who's been sequencing nematode genomes. And I thank you for your attention. Thank you. We have time for questions. We have microphones, and uh, this talk is being recorded, so it's especially important uh, that you use your microphones. And so we have runners, or I can just huck this thing at you. So however you want to do it, we, it's we have a, a question over there with a the microphone, so you're off the hook. Hi, Peter. Hi. So the, this uh, fascinating idea of the chromosomes somehow staying together, does um, Diploscapta allow you to, to, to test some of the predictions of that? What happens there? Do they all just end up randomizing very quickly? So um, the answer is no. I mean, Dave Fitch can give you a uh, chapter and verse in this. Uh, the the um, Diploscaptor pachys genome analysis shows very nicely that it seems that two of, the two of the chromosomes likely fused first, and it's possible to identify what those are. Diploscaptor, I should say, is the sister genus to Cinerobditis, so it's, it's expected to be close genom genomically. So two of those chromosomes fused first, just based on the, the associations between um, uh, genes that, origin that are now on C. elegans, uh, particular linkage groups. So you can s tell the order of fusion. Um, the Diploscaptor genome is not in one contig. It's one chromosome, so it has to be in one contig. The Diploscaptor genome is not in one contig, and that's something that would be really exciting to see, to see whether um, the Negon units have broken down in Diploscaptor. In C. elegans, um during meiosis, each has a specific pairing center, right? Each chromosome, so and and there are specific protein for each. I forgot that. Yeah, yeah. right. Yeah. So could the number six be related to the possibility of diversification of this family? You, you just think about. Yeah. That? So so C. elegans chromosomes, and as far as we know, most all all that rhabditis group, they're holocentric, which means that there's no focused um, centromeric function, but there is a pairing center, and there is one per chromosome. Um, so this pattern of six could be a result of the fact that there are 12 telomeric bits, and so you could, um, is, as, you know, you have 12 telomeric bits, so you can have six bits in between, or you have six pairing centers, and um, therefore you have six units. But that means these pairing centers have been conserved for whatever it is, I mean, 200 million years of evolution. And in the nemat... Hmm? Yeah, but the proteins bind to those pairing centers because of local sequence features is the expectation. So, so how is that organized? I mean, it'd be, it'd be great to work this out in, 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 other, in other species. So it'd be very interesting to sequence, yes, all the normal 
um, rhabditine nematodes, which have six chromosomes, but also those, for example, in Diploscapta, which have six, five, seven, and one. I was wondering if any marine nematode had been sequenced yet, or any nematode, um, and then by that I mean pat bio sequence, uh, so that you could look at chromosomes. Yeah. Uh, or any nematode that actually still retains CTC out had uh, had its whole genome sequenced so that we could see what the ancestral, well, the basal state would have looked like. Um, in terms of uh, non-terrestrial uh, nematode sequencing, there are some sequences available. They're all Illumina. They're all horribly fragmented, um, or wonderfully fragmented, depending on <laughs> which way around you go. Um, you can all have our Inoplus assembly if you would like it. Georges will tell you how bad it is. Um, so there are no packed biosequences of, of uh, good chromosomal ones. Um, I haven't looked for CTCF. Um, we can do it after the talk. Okay. <laughs> I wonder if there are any uh, sequence, or I'm sure there are some, but I if you can uh, talk about some of them, uh, sequence characteristics, sequence features that are correlated with developmental rate. So for example, the splitting of the notch functions might correlate to faster, I don't know if that's true, but might correlate to faster developing. Age. Are there other characteristics that you've been able to pull out like that that can we relate to either rate of embryogenesis or, or total development time? We haven't looked at, at that at all. Um, very happy to supply the data so you can look at it. So every single one of those ortho orthology groups within Cinerabditis or across the, the nematoda, um, you can build a tree from that and ask of that tree, what do you correlate with in the morphological space of the tax that are represented in the, in the leaves? So it would be possible to, to ask those questions if you want, but we haven't delved into that. I just had a question about the GC content pattern. Yeah. Do you think that's just reflecting the gene density across the chromosomes where you have uh, more homogeneity and uh, GC content within coding sequences? So would you see that if you just look at intergenic? Uh, so gene density across arms and centers is not that different. So it's, it's not hugely different between arms and centers. In fact, some, some arms have greater uh, gene, gene density than do the centers. Uh, conserved genes, yes, are denser in the centers, but gene density in itself, now, now that we have these, it's true. <laughs> we, can, we can look at it. So, so um, I, I don't think it's just um, non-coding regions. We, we could go back and look at that. It's just a useful way of, in the absence of uh, uh, congruent and coherent mapping of repeats and invert repeats using the same techniques and technology, we actually look at the pattern of, of um, uh, sequence, diver uh, sequence difference across the chromosomes. But there's something about the, the centers that are much more homogenous than the arms. It's not unexpected if you have a repeat, for example, of the SL1 gene, there's a particular GC content of that repeat, and that will give you a spike in GC content. So it's, it's not too surprising, it's just a nice way of, of, of showing it. But it's a, it's a strong signal. 